Welcome back to With Love series. I'm really excited because today, one of my best, dearest friends and very talented astrologer is going to be speaking with us about astrology, everyone's favorite topic. So Sophie Wan is a New York-based astrologer focusing on relationship compatibility. As a relationship anthropologist, it was only natural that Sophie would one day stumble upon astrology. She believes the stars are a way better way to understand ourselves and how we show up in our relationships. While not reading charts, she is currently the co-founder of a Vedic astrology-based dating app, Reha, that is set to launch in India at the end of of the year. So what's actually amazing about Sophie is that she reads Western astrology and Vedic astrology. So she actually has the knowledge of both, which is like very rare. I'm so excited. I feel like astrology not has a bad rap, but just isn't quite understood in the way it's supposed to be. So this will be a fun. Yeah. Time. No, you're totally right. A lot of people find it very woo woo, but it's actually an incredible tool once you understand it. But of course it's like pretty complex. So we're going to break it down to its most simplistic form with her. So I'm so excited to have her on and yeah, let's get started. Hi, Sophie. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome on. We're so excited to talk astrology with you. I'm so excited happy to be on. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah. So let's just start with your journey, your relationship anthropologist, which I love. So let's talk a little bit about what that is and also how you found astrology. Yeah. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sophie. I call myself a relationship anthropologist. I'm also an astrologer. Um, and a, re a relationship anthropologist essentially is someone who is severely interested in studying the dynamics of relationships. So what does that have to do with astrology? Well, you know, astrology essentially is the study of the celestial bodies and how they impact humans. And so um, through assessing astrological patterns, I'm interested in researching and diving in to how we can assess our own patterns and our partner's patterns. So essentially understanding the, the dynamic of synastry and just in general, how, how do you operate in a relation and what kind of people are you attracting? What kind of energy are you attracting? And the planets essentially will show you a glimpse into, you know, actually a comprehensive profile, not just the glimpse, but of who you are and who you're attracted to and perhaps even answering why. Mm. That's very... And how did you sort of like, did, were you interested in understanding compatibility and then you found astrology or did you find astrology? And then that made you more interested in compatibility. Like, huh, there's something to this. Well, so I first began my journey with astrology because I noticed that all my friends had birthdays around specific months. So for example, December was a really heavy birthday month, but like I would have nothing in October and then like May would be a really heavy month um, and nothing really in April. And I thought that's kind of odd. Like, is this just me? Is just everybody? Um, and then of course I spiraled into, okay, it's interesting that the people that I'm dating um, consistently have similar birthdays, birthdays in <laughs> A month um actually two people i dated back have the same exact birthday and i thought that is just creepy and weird like <laughs> and that is it was too coincidental like the patterns of the types of energy you attract are by no mistake and it's not like i'm proactively going out there being like is your birthday this date oh if so like let's date you know that's definitely not what I was doing. So that's actually really how I got interested. And I realized, wow, like a lot of my good girlfriends are Sagittarius. I have the Taurus girlfriends. Like, why is that? 
Um, and then, of course, that spurred a whole deep dive into astrology and what kind of personality traits are associated with these signs. Um, similarly, I was dating a lot of Capricorn and wondering, okay, let's go off. Like, why, why is that? And that's really where the journey began. And if you ask yourself these same questions, like, are there certain birthdays that I'm attracting? Are there certain months where I just have like a boatload of birthdays and other months where there's just nothing? You will find that you have your own patterns. And these patterns are really specific to who you are and characterizes, you know, essentially the type of energy you draw in, you know, at the end of the day, we are bodies of energy. Um, and astrology is really, you know, the theory of microcosm, macrocosm. So the energy that we hold in ourselves and our bodies is the same energy that is a part of the universe with the planet. So essentially the birth chart is a snapshot of the map of your life. So each person has a really unique birth chart um, with all the different planets in all the different positions. So the moment you are born, the, you know, imagine a map of the sky with all the planets captured at that exact. And that map can really inform you of these patterns that are really specific to who you are and who you're attracting in your life. Yeah. And isn't there like, you told me one time there were some crazy, it was a very large number of how rare it is to even find someone who has a chart similar to yours, because there are so many different combinations. Like it really is so unique to each individual, like a thumbprint essentially. Absolutely. So, um, you're even twins that are born don't have the same exact chart because usually twins are born within four minutes apart and within four minutes, the, charts actually change. So if you ever meet your astrological twin, so the person with the same exact birth date, birth time, and birth location, um, this person weirdly have the very similar patterns to your life. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have this misconception that astrology is predictive, it is not predictive. I mean, it's <laughs> predictive to some level, but I get a lot of questions of when am I going to get married? When am I going to get married? And that should actually, yes, astrology can inform you of like energetically when you're open to certain, you know, love and energetically when just in general, you're in a better place. But at the end of the day, you have to remember that one third of how your life unfolds is up to free will. And that's a huge percentage, you know, 33.3%. That's a huge percentage. I believe that the other third is astrologically driven. So just energetically, how are you feeling? What kinds of highs and lows are you going through in life? And then the other 33.3% is really driven by the karma that you're born with. And, you know, that's something that you can't really control. Um, what kind of baggage are you bringing in to this life of form of yours and what kind of challenges do you have to work through before you know you can enter into the next phase so that's really how i believe mm. um your life unfolds and how a relationship will unfold yeah i once actually had an astrologer tell me like listen, the chart is accurate, but we still have free will. And if we didn't, then like, if everything in the chart was an exact story of your life, then what would be the point? Where would be the fun if there was mm -hmm. no free will in it? So I really love that you make that point because I think the people who want to sort of like toss astrology out the window and be like, oh, this is just a bunch of hoopla. I'm not going to believe it. It's because they have this idea in their minds that it's trying to tell you everything and tell you the future when like, we still have to make our own decisions. Like, you know, even with every sign, there's an opportunity to tap into the light or the shadow of it. Right. Mm. So that's something that I think is very worth noting. And that I really love that you pointed out. Yes. No, I mean, it's super important. And I think it's, um, you know, people think that astrology is pseudoscience and at the end of the day, 
Um, we can't ignore that there are uh, celestial bodies in the sky. We can't ignore the fact that there are planets and celestial bodies that do affect us. Like, for example, the moon is, which is the closest, you know, um, to our, our earth right now. It's actually a full moon. So happy full moon, everyone. Oh, yeah. um, but during, you know, during a full moon, the tides are higher. Um, there are more births that occur on a full moon. Um, so we have the body of water around us being completely influenced by the moon. That is something you cannot deny. Um, that, that is measured science. Mm -hmm. You know, to think that our bodies are 60% water, but we're not affected. Like this is hoopla. It doesn't affect us. Like it's almost <laughs> a bit silly. Right. Um, yeah. And then of course, you know, we have all these other planets like Jupiter, Venus, Mars, and there is no concrete science proving the exact way that we are impacted, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going off of the theory of the microcosm macrocosm and that like these different planets, which represent different things in our life do impact us. So, and I want to talk a little bit about um, this whole map of the sky and how like you essentially can dive into who you are and what kind of energy you're attracting because you know when you think about astrology you have to think about it as a story and a map and it's the map of you and your life so mm -hmm. you essentially are the who the planets are the what and they represent what's going on and what are you know different themes and symbols um signs are the how you know, and it's more of characteristically how, and then the houses are the where. So when you build, you can essentially easily translate a narrative with these different components. Um, and I would actually dive into a little bit of your chart and Ariel's chart, because I have it pulled up here, you know, essentially. Yes. <laughs> See? Got that full moon transiting the 11th house today. Ooh. Yes. Um, and everybody manifests because the full moon is like perfect for, you know, it's a portal of energy and it's a bit intense, but um, definitely um, manifest and look to see where it is. But just going into charts, um, and I want to pull up Ariel's to begin with. Um, so, you know, Ariel, chart, and you have a and I'm using the Vedic system actually. So, Oh, and can you just kind of explain like, what is the main difference between Western astrology and Vedic astrology? And do you find that one is more accurate? Cause I feel that, you know, most people are really familiar with the American, they're not the American, but the like Western version with the wheel, but does the Vedic system use the wheel? Um, the Vedic system looks a little bit different. It doesn't use the wheel, but essentially the di biggest difference is, um, the Western system goes off of the Hellenistic system where the thought is there's exactly 20 hours in a day. And that's how we're going to track the concept of time. Mm -hmm. um, the Vedic system goes by what I call the sidereal system. And this theory is um, tracking time for the exact measurement of the day. So there's actually 23 hours, uh, 56 minutes and four in uh, in one day so over the span of 72 years it throws the degrees off by one degree and you would think okay that's not that's not that much but like over the span of you know thousands of years that's going to start adding up and so mm -hmm. you'll see that your vedic sign there's a bit of a shift so for example in my um astrology my western astrology sign is cancer but in vedic it's gemini and i know mm -hmm. for you care heart your um western sign is virgo but in vedic astrology your, your sun sign is I will, it's leo yes sorry i have to say that i really do resonate with that <laughs> yeah so i don't really believe that there's one versus the other that's like more accurate um they're both 
different maps of the sky. It's as if you were reading a compass versus a paper map. They're both mm. in the direction. It's oh, I like that different. analogy. Yeah, it's they're both accurate. Um, I'm not an astrologer that I say like you should only use this or you sh you should use the one that resonates more with you and the Vedic system resonates more with me personally. So that is what I like to use. Is Ariel a Gemini in the Vedic system as well? Yes. So that is the thing is Ariel, you are Gemini in both systems. So oh, wow. sometimes is key. Yeah. It is so it's that well, and your Venus is in Gemini. So you're extra Gemini. Oh wow. Yes. So um there's some overlap that you can that you can see, but I really do believe that the information that you'll be receiving, the big picture, the big storyline um, is essentially the same and doesn't really change. So you can really deduce a lot of similar findings with, with what information you're given. Mm. Gotcha. And you also have this thing that you develop called the three non-negotiables, which I love. So mm -hmm. since Sophie has been working on this dating app and all these algorithms to understand compatibility, and I've seen them on her computer, they are incredible <laughs> and intense. And I'm so excited for the world to finally have this app. Um, it's, it's going to change lives. It's incredible. Um, but can you tell us the three non-negotiables just so um, anyone listening can maybe find their chart and kind of like look to that when they want to understand what they need in relationship compatibility or in a relationship in general? Absolutely. So, um, and for people that are watching that don't know their chart, you can easily find your chart on, you know, your Vedic chart or an astro stage, and then your Western chart on astro charts. You can Google it and type it in. But essentially, what I love about astrology is it informs us of what our deal breakers are. And in love, we have all these like this crazy checklist of like, I need him, you know, especially us ladies, I need him to be like, and handsome and smart and you know you, you kind of want this chuckle right at all you kind of want the sun and the moon and the stars and everything that like the galaxy can offer right but at the end of the day we want it all we want it all we don't want to <laughs> compromise or settle ever <laughs> no one i mean no one i mean like both men and women we all have this checklist and I'm guilty of doing this too but essentially what I love about astrology is it, it it actually pinpoints the three things that you actually really need and this is associated with your values and you can see this in your sun sign your moon sign and your venus sign so the sun represents your ego your identity it's you know your soul and this doesn't change the person you your soul doesn't change the essence um so based on your sun sign you can tell okay like what do i actually need so for example ariel like you are sun sign gemini so you really need somebody that holds gemini qualities and it doesn't mean you need to go out and look for another gemini but you need somebody that is going to you're going to be intellectually compatible with and someone that's really going to communicate because mm -hmm. gemini is the sign of communication care heart your sign sun sign being leo in vedic astrology you are the queen leo is royal so you yeah. need somebody <laughs> that is going to treat you like a queen so these are just these are examples you know just from your own personal but you look at the sun sign and you see what what is the sign telling me about what i need in, of you know from my partner what what essentially do i need serve to me um and really feeding your soul so carol your soul needs to feel like a queen and like Ariel, your soul needs to have that intellectual bond and communication. Um, next, so true for her too. <laughs> next is the moon sign, and the moon represents our emotions. 
our subconscious. It's the way we feel. It's actually the way we think too. Um, because we do think with our emotions. So knowing your moon sign, you can, you can tell and see, okay, what do I actually need from my moon sign? So Carol Hart in Vedic astrology, your moon sign is in Virgo. So Virgo is very meticulous and particular. It's the young maiden too. So you need, you know, this person that's a bit analytical, meticulous, and has a youth is going to bring some youth and vitality into your world. Um, <laughs> I love that you said it bring youth to your world. <laughs> like literally. The charts don't lie. Um, and Ariel, your moon sign is in Pisces. So in Vedic astrology. Mm-hmm. So Pisces is very, it's intellectual it's romantic it's dreamy it's idealistic and you you need someone that's going to build this emotional world that really embodies ideals um so you know those are the two and then the third is really seen from venus and venus is the planet of love and beauty it's the way we love it's what kind of abundance we need um venus when you think about her as a goddess she is the goddess of love and beauty and she's a very very luxurious lady so what things do you need in order to feel abundant and feel loved so based on this you know you can also tell what exactly you really need when it comes to this deal breaker so ariel for you your Venus is in Taurus and that is a very, that's actually its natal placement and Taurus. So Taurus and Venus are like go hand in hand. So you actually need someone that's going to make you feel like a luxurious lady. You like nice things. You want to be wined and dying. You need to be romantic. Like that's very important to you. And, you know, I'm not saying that a lot of people think, Oh my God, that mean I'm superficial and it's like no you actually really need those and those are in your chart so ladies if you have a boyfriend and you're he's complaining that you're too high maintenance you can say well my Venus is in Taurus and (laughs) I need to be a luxurious lady men do also have Venus in Taurus and I've met some men that need that lux life too just oh absolutely Absolutely. It goes both ways. The charts do not discriminate based on gender. <laughs> um, and, you know, Carol Hart, Hart, your Venus cancer. And for you, I know you're like, oh, cancer, what? Uh. What is this? But cancer is all about nurture and like feeling emotionally rich supported and you really need that in order to feel loved and adored and abundant. So those are just example, many examples of what we can learn, you know, so, and I need a lot of, are these the three non-negotiables you're talking about? Yes. These are the three non-negotiables and sun, the moon, and then Mm -hmm. Venus Venus. is where you should look to understand what it is you actually need, not want, but what you need in a relationship. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So these are just things that I, that are really great to know and that you can really assess, um, when, you know, trying to pick a partner. So, you know, even for myself, I had dated somebody that actually didn't traveling. And if you actually look at my astrological makeup, one of my major placements is in Sagittarius, which is the traveler. So, and of course, that's something that we always fought over was like, I wanted to go around the world. And he was like, I want to stay home. So Mm -hmm. these are things that you're not going to let up on. But obviously, if you know them and your partner is lacking in them, you can work towards leveling, you know, and compromise and like being on the same page about the expectations. That makes sense. So then when someone says, what's my rising sign, what Mm -hmm. does that mean? How does that influence someone? So I'm so glad you asked this question, Ariel. The rising sign essentially is the sign that was rising in the East the moment you were born. And it's really what kickstarts off your chart. So it is absolutely critical 
when it comes to knowing yourself, knowing the map of kind of the way your life is shaped. Um, and it's essentially the first place where your chart starts. Um, and we talked a little bit about the house system. And like I said, the with the houses, the where when it comes to your story. Um, so knowing you're rising, you know where all the houses sit. And so when I look at astrology, the first house, which is your rising sign, really represents you and who you are and your identity. Um, the second house represents your family, but also your familial assets and the things that you save. It represents like assets you inherit. So it really is associated with the house of wealth, but familial wealth. The third house is the house of communication. The fourth house is the house of family, um, family, but specifically home, mm. home structure, um, the fifth house is the house of creativity, children, romance. Uh, the sixth house is the house of debts and enemies and health routines. Um, and then the seventh house, which is extremely important when it comes to assessing relationships and your relationship you know, patterns is the house of partnership and house of marriage. And it's super important for both romantic relationships, but also your business partnerships. So it's really the house that rules significant joint partnerships and relationships. And it will inform you of what kind of relationships you need, what kind that you have and the type that you attract. The eighth house is the house of um, death, rebirth, sex, transformation, which a lot of people think is a little bit scary. It's a psychic house, um, but it's very powerful. And the ninth house is the house of philosophy, learning, um, foreign travels. The 10th house, which a lot of people ask me about, is all about career and your public image. Um, and then the 11th house is about your social network, but also the income that you bring in for yourself. It's the economic gains. And then lastly, the 12th house is the house of hidden desires, hidden talents, house of, they call it the house of troubles because of the hidden desires, but really it's the house of the medical part of, you know, who you are. So People that have this placement, heavy placements, heavy planets in here um, tend to be extremely imaginative and creative because they kind of live in a whole nother zone on their own planet. But you essentially need the rising to understand where all of your houses live. And so specific, you know, understanding this is the map of your life. And if you visualize the astrological chart, you should visualize it like a board game and each little tile is a house mm. telling a story. Mm. Now for a long time, I did not believe in astrology, but when you actually start to see the houses, it makes so much more sense. So even in Western astrology, my son is in Virgo, but it's in the fifth house of Leo along with a couple other planets. And mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, this makes more sense. Cause I never felt like a typical Virgo. I felt like I had traits that were a little bit more Leo leaning. So I highly encourage anybody listening right now to definitely pay attention to the house systems. I almost find that they're like, it, it, they're so important in telling the story. Yeah. And I also think that, um, a lot of people have a misconception that like, you know, cause they read these astrology articles that oh, um, the today you will be yeah, the horoscopes today. And you should like, read if for you're rising, Aries, if anything. <laughs> yeah, it, it should be, but also it's like very like blanketed state. Like, Oh, you'll feel flirty today. And it's kind <laughs> of like, I, I, I don't really subscribe to those. Um, I really think that there's so much more complex information you can assess and analyze, um, you know, and like we, as humans, we are complicated. So when you actually look at an astrology chart, 
it looks complicated and it looks complicated because we are complicated. (laughs) And that is something that is so critical to remember is, you know, it's not a one all like Ariel and Carhartt just because you guys are once this moon doesn't mean like it it doesn't put you in a specific box, you know, because there's Mm -hmm. so many different permutations of the signs and the houses you know, where everything, the planets and like where everything is in your charts. So it's really important to remember that these are just tools to help you understand and analyze yourself. So then where does, when people say we're transitioning into this house with this full moon or new moon, how does that come Mm -hmm. into play? So essentially, um, this is a great way to assess where the moon is impacting your life, right? Because I told you the houses are the where and the moon is a technically what. So the moon represents your mind, your emotions, the subconscious. It's a very powerful planet. And Vedic astrology really believes that the moon is almost more important than the sun Mm. um, because it's so much closer to our planet. And it really represents the subconscious that drives us. So what is important to understand when you, you know, look up the moon and where it's transiting in your house. So for instance, Care Heart, you said that the moon was transiting in your eleventh house. Mm-hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. which really means, you know, an eleventh house represents networks, it represents huge friend circles, it represents economic gains, it reckon, it, you know, income that you're bringing for yourself. And in Vedic astrology, it's a very auspicious house. Um, so it's really important to kind of take, be mindful and take in, okay, how, how am I feeling? It's like, a, it's almost like a check-in, like a mindful mm. check-in to, how am I assessing my economic gains and my friend circles? That's just a quick, dirty way of really assessing that. I think it's an amazing way to track growth as well, or to even like utilize the energy available. Um, I often find that I'm like subconsciously already operating where the moon was like today. Um, I sent like some sessions over to a producer and it was like something I, could have done all week. But then today I was like, Oh, the energy felt right. And then I looked and it's like, Oh, okay. The full moon's in my 11th house of network and community and all that. And that made perfect. Yeah. It made perfect sense for me. Um, but even just when, Oh, even a few months ago when, or a year ago, my God, when I had the new moon transiting my seventh house and Sophie said, write down everything you want in a partner and get specific. And I was like, I don't want a partner. I don't want a boyfriend. I don't want to date anybody. And literally that day I met my boyfriend. So that's just like, it's so crazy when you work with the moon cycles. It, I know it sounds crazy because before I was like, what? But when you really like link, like kind of sync up with the, what area of life it's impacting, it can have a profound, um, impact on you really. Mm, That's such a good point. I feel like many times there's many people that are, I'm trying to manifest this one particular thing and then feel like they're hitting a rock wall or not getting anywhere in that category. So that's kind of cool to say, like maybe you're trying to manifest this new career, but the energy is in relationships or you're trying to manifest the energy is in wellness. So that's really cool to see. It's not taking a slap on you for your manifestation skills, but more like work with the energy of where you're at already. Yes. That's why I love astrology and numerology so much. And it's interesting you say wellness because the full moon's actually transiting Ariel's. I was just about to say that because I looked it up on my phone as you were talking. Um, (laughs) but yes, that is exactly, I was just about to go into that Ariel, the full moon is transiting in your sixth house, which is the house of health, the house of routines structure it's Mm -hmm. the house of debt so if you're like you know if you want to put energy into paying off any type of debt like this is the time this Mm -hmm. is the energy this is the intent you have to go in with um and it's also the house of enemies so if you feel like you have people coming at you you know it's it's a portal of energy to really muster up this 
courage and the, the strength that you need to defeat any type of, you know, problematic individuals that you might be facing mm -hmm. in your life. Um, but absolutely that, you know, it's good to, to be mindful of the, where the energy leading you to. Hmm. For some reason, I thought that the 12th house was the house of enemies. Um, so in, in Vedic astrology, it's, it's the sixth house, which rules oh. like, yeah, but in, and it's interesting because in Western astrology, I really take the 12th as the house of, um, hidden things. So I guess one could technically interpreted as enemies. Um, and I actually think that the 12th house is the house of your own, your internal enemies, like your own inner demons. Mm. Um, cause it's right next to your first house, but it's the, all the, all the stuff you can't see. And it's, mm -hmm. the, it's everything you can't see, but within yourself, it's the house of that metaphysical that you're almost in a whole different planet it's that's why they call it the house of troubles, but really troubles in this form of addiction. And if you're struggling with your own inner demon, so that's really how I, I, I interpret that. So I really see the sixth house as the house of, um, the outside world, like interrupting you. you know? mm. So we talked about astrology, uh, affecting us on a personal level. And then with relationships do would people use astrology in regards to um, business partnerships or um not so much friendships but different contracts do you look into the numbers the planets when looking to partner with someone oh absolutely i definitely <laughs> and i feel like people make fun of me but like i there's a like the energy is a and so you're gonna and assess the pattern similar to how you assess any pattern but even for my own business partner I had a whole reading done before I went into business with him and he's such a great individual and our partnership has been so wonderful um you know just because the outcome says that your partnership might be challenging doesn't mean that you shouldn't partner with someone like I think that's where people get miss you know take polarized the interpretation of astrology, it just means that you really need to be mindful of certain challenges that might arise. Mm -hmm. um, and every relationship is going to have its challenges. So it's really important to look up what kind of relationship and partnership are you going to have with this person in business? You know, I mean, and at the end of the day, like marriage is business. You sign a formal contract, your marriage certificate you merge your assets, your bank accounts. Like, so it very much goes hand in hand with each other for sure. And I will say that I look at the synastry between myself and all of my friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I like, I like, patterns, to, right? you, know. you can see patterns. Yes, exactly. And, and, oh my God, you know, so you know, all my us? patterns. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really amazing because you can see like, what am I really bringing to this relationship? What is the other person teaching me? Like, and then also like, where are we healing? You know, that's something I, I do love about Western astrology is Chiron, the wounded healer, which Vedic doesn't use, doesn't consider Chiron to be anything, right? That's correct. I mean, really Vedic actually only, um, assesses the inner planets like so uranus pluto neptune like those outer planets that you can't see they don't really uh, analyze and assess this it's really the first you know nine um but yes that is something that is really beautiful about western astrology is assessing where your hidden trauma in your wounds are um and being able to identify you know where a certain individual can bring healing when mm -hmm. you it comes to looking at your synastry. So if you know Ariel is Chiron, I actually am going to look it up. Is in a specific house for you. That is the area that she's helped to. She's here to help. You know, I can't. Is this the second house? I can't remember right now. I am. I always here. attract the Chiron in the twelfth house. <laughs> 
Um, so it is the second house. So oh, your relationship to right. worth, your relationship, she's here to help you learn about your relationship to wealth, to money, to inner worth. And like, she's here to heal those that you might associate, you know, mm -hmm. um, with, with those concepts, those, those themes. And in reverse, you, Carol Hart, are here to help. Ariel, because your Chi Chiron is in her ninth house, and Ooh. ninth house is all about learning, philosophy, beliefs, and you're here to help her heal any types of wounds and trauma that she might have with these concepts. Oh, sense. and totally. And Ariel has helped me so much to be more organized and to like own my power and like no, like care hard. You're good enough. You need to be doing this. You need to put yourself mm -hmm. out there. And I feel like on the reverse, I'm like, Ariel, you're like way more gifted than you realize. Like you have psychic gifts too. Like believe in them. You have them. You're so intuitive. Basically we're a perfect match. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in the love cards, we're the soulmate match. So, Hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just assessing your synastry, you guys have a beautiful synastry going on, you know, where when I look at where you guys impact each other, so essentially the way I like to look at how, what areas are you illuminating for the other person? And you can see that based on the charts and the sin. And so really diving in and seeing, okay, where where his care heart's son in your house so ariel care son is in your 11th house so essentially being able to help you think of brainstorm and illuminating different new streams of income and opening up your eyes to a whole new network so those are the areas that she's really illuminating for you um and you know, on the reverse, Ariel's son is also in your second house. So it's Chiron and the sun in the second house, which is illuminating your inner <laughs> worth and the way that you value yourself. Because second house is all about, you know, both internal, but also material value and worth. So yeah. it's a beautiful synastry. And I love seeing the sun in those positive houses you want to mm -hmm. see the sun being illuminated in those positive houses now not that like if you guys had the sun being illuminated in what i would call all the more um challenging houses that's okay too and it's yeah. just good to be mindful of where you might you know feel this energetic illumination is it's it's really interesting to actually see it on pattern like on paper in a pattern yeah the way that i view synastry is like listen anyone can be with anyone but how hard do you want your life to be <laughs> that's like always how i've seen it because you know there are certain things that are non-negotiables that are like hey like i just don't want any of this in my life and like if that shows up in the chart then you know if you really don't want that you don't have to participate but i think that you know we really do grow through challenges we grow from people who are like vastly different from us who have something to teach us so i and i always feel that again, anyone can really be with anyone, but what, what have your findings been? Cause you've been developing all these algorithms for the dating app. Like, mm -hmm. do you believe anyone can be with anyone? Like what, I know you've studied other couples and their charts and like, tell us more about that. I have. So my finding is that, yes, I agree with you. Um, anyone, because right. We still have a third of the pie is free will. So if your free will is strong enough, like you really can make it work, but it's a matter of like, how hard do you want your life? And I'm a firm believer that certain people bring like good energy. They open up these like doors that you just, you, you need to have open that you wouldn't have, have open if you hadn't met this person versus someone else who is just kind of bringing not 
energy, but energy that's maybe not so compatible with you. Mm -hmm. So it's really about um, assessing, you know, like you said, how difficult do you want your life to be? And what's really interesting is in the app that I've developed, I have developed an algorithm and the algorithm a score essentially. And based on the score, we will match you or we will not match you, but I won't be revealing to people what that score is because at the end of the day, it's just the threshold score. Um, and the reason why there's even a score or a cutoff is because I won't want people to have the easiest time making their relationship and marriage work. So I want to give you the most compatible and you definitely, it's interesting because the one thing that say will be nearly, I mean, just extraordinarily challenging in two people's chart is if you have your karmic node, your North node in the house of marriage and partnership, and your partner also has a karmic North node in their house of marriage and partnership. That's two people having these really, you know, challenging placements for love mm. and relationships and partnerships, both coming together. It's going to be, it's going to be a little rough. Like you will be learning all of your, all of the karmic challenges and lessons you're supposed to learn going to be tied to that partner. And that partner is similarly tied to you. And it just makes life a little bit more difficult. Um, so the one divorced couple I have seen and I've done their compatibility, they both had that placement in their charts. Mm -hmm. um, and it was almost like a, what, what's it called? Like a Romeo, Juliet, star cross, like just, you know, they were meant to come into each other's lives and teach each other a lot about partnership and love and marriage, but um, things ended up not working out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that karmic lesson, you don't want to have like your karmic no be exactly the same if you have a role, if it's in the house of relationship and partnership, because that person already has a hard time with learning about relationships and partnerships. And then you also do too. So you want actually the complement. You want a polarization to balance each other out. So th that's probably the one one um, synastry I would say, like, I wouldn't recommend yeah. matching. Um, and I haven't come across a couple I've had. That was the only couple I've seen where they both had that karmic node and they were divorced. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather not fight upstream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I also think, you know, it's really interesting because with the karmic nodes that I was talking about, the North node, the North node isn't a planet. It's literally the node of the moon. It's the North node of the moon. Similarly, you have this and the North node represents the future. It represents your destiny presents the types of life lessons you're supposed to learn and the challenges. So whatever this area is, you will experience um, a lot of challenges, but equally you will experience, you know, great, great joy from mm. conquering and um, learning these lessons. So, you know, depending on each person has their North node, each person has their South node. The South node represents your past life karma of what you essentially already had accomplished. But it also represents kind of like the mirror to what lesson you, you failed to learn too. So mm. knowing these things in your chart is really profound. You know, um, I had, to, I was reading for somebody in their North node was in the sign of Capricorn. Capricorn's all about discipline, responsibility, maturity. And this That's person- That's Kalia, by the way, her North Node in <laughs> Capricorn. Good to know. So, <laughs> you know, in Capricorn is very, um, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, the father, it's a masculine sign. So the themes about learning responsibility and maturity, and essentially it's being disciplined and growing up. 
and it has to do with the masculine energy. So Mm. these lessons are tied to the father and the relationship with the father. So it's really interesting seeing how, where this is for your partner and, you know, helping that person along his or her journey and being mindful of, oh, that makes so much sense as to why they're wired this way or how they're wired this way. And this is the type of energetic, you know, makeup that they, they hold. So I always find these, these really helpful when it comes to understanding relationship compatibility and relationship synastry. You can essentially see karmically, like, where is Ariel? helping you care heart and care heart. Where are you helping Ariel learn these karmic lessons? These are points of friction. So it'd almost be really important to do as a parent child to parent. Absolutely. That's really cool. Yeah. And I love, I love doing these types of readings where it's parent child. Mm. And every, you know, and I have done a couple of um, children's readings, but it's like parents at the end of the day, they just want their child to be, happy and fulfilled and loved and successful so Mm -hmm. it's really really amazing to see like okay this is the snapshot of what your child's energetic tendencies are what their patterns are and what type of what types of just challenges they will encounter in the lesson for sure so what's all needed for a reading so you need your date of birth time of birth and then place of birth? Yes. Anything else? Those are the three sure. things that you need. Um, and if you want a partner, also read like your this industry with your partner, your business partner, romantic partner, child. I need. I would need the exact same three pieces of data. Like just because I have one person's and then the right. other person's like missing one doesn't it doesn't work that way. And I feel like people always ask, can you do it without my birth time? And I feel like it would vary so much that it's not, you really yeah, do. It does. I mean, I can only give you like a third of information mm. um, because the houses, which is what the time is, right? The right, because the gotcha. rising time is like the sun rising from the east and what exact moment. So um, I, I have no, I'm like completely blind to the house and the house is the where. So you have to think about it in the terms of like reading a novel, like you don't know, you don't know the where you only know the who, the That'd what, and the how you don't know the where <laughs> I can tell you information. Like for instance, I just told you about the karmic lesson of Capricorn. Like, I don't know where it is, but I know that that's what the lesson, it, what it is and how it's transpiring. I just don't know where. Gotcha. Yeah. So basically it's like, look, we should think of astrology less of a timeline, but more of like a guide map being like, this is energetically, this is the type of career that you would thrive in, or this is the type of um, job that you could do really well in and less being like, okay, when I hit 25, I'm going to do this. And when I hit 30, I'm going to get married. See what I'm saying? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and at the end of the day, like, are based on our, our choices that we make, like our life just mm. unfolds so differently. So I always say like, use astrology as a, a map, a guide, a general direction. Um, and, you know, people get really obsessed with planning everything perfectly, mm. especially, I mean, and it's crazy right now because, you know, the environment is a bit chaotic, um, both energetically and politically. So we all are feeling a little lost. We're all feeling like, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed mm-hmm. to go? Who am I? Mm-hmm. And we, you know, at the end of the day, astrology will be able to help guide you, but it won't, it won't make the decisions for you a lot of people ask me is this person my part person and i'm like i you, only you can answer that <laughs> I, I can't answer that i can only answer you what your challenges are what the compatibility looks like and like what kind of lessons you guys are teaching each other like you're supposed to choose you have to choose you mm. can't just like offload that on to the universe and be like choose for me mm. so that's something to be really mindful of but yes that's so fascinating. I feel like we're coming close on time. Yeah. I, th- this has been so eye-opening. And I really love, again, that 
you understand the Vedic piece because it's people are so specific with Western or Vedic. And I feel that having both in your toolbox is just so incredible. And especially like when you read for me and it was the Vedic chart, it was cool to see like the timing in Vedic astrology was very specific and different from Western. Um, or even just where I landed with like being a sun in Leo versus the sun in Virgo. So I am so excited for people to be experienced bows to your wisdom and knowledge through the app. And, um, for those who want to like learn more, maybe even have a reading with you, where can they find you? Um, they can find me on my Instagram at Sophie S Juan. And yes, I do do one-on-one readings, not so much uh, lately these days because we're building out the app, but, um, I'm more than happy to questions i love talking about this information i love giving people a tool and understanding and assessing who they are and the app will be available um in later in november but it is for the indian so we are launching in india first and hopefully next year we'll have it be a global app but you know vedic astrology really resonates in india and like 95 get their astrology match uh, Mm. before they even get married because they want to know what is the energy like what am I signing up for what's the outlook looking like so you know people there's a huge huge presence of this in the country that is going to be the number one most populated country in the next five years so there's something to it and it's been it's centuries old yeah I'm looking forward to it. Well, congratulations on your app. That's that's amazing. (laughs) Thank you. And thank you guys so much for having me on the show. It's always so wonderful seeing your beautiful faces. You as well. One of the questions we always end with is, um, do you have a favorite quote or a motto or saying that you live your life by? Um, I think it's something simple. Just do you. Mm. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) Like that's so kind of like a that, true astrologer. I mean, that's pretty you? much what we were talking about the whole time is how uniquely different we all are. So just yeah. get good at being you. Yeah. Just do you own who you are? Do your thing and don't look okay. back. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's not a more beautiful, like long. No, it's amazing. Esoteric. <laughs> no, like, I mean, the best wisdom is typically the simplest right just yep. like to the point like just embrace who you are i agree right I and agree. it's easier said than done i feel like the more that we mature the more we like actually are like you know what fuck it i'm gonna be me because you know there's always going to be someone who disagrees with what i say or what i do and i just gotta like bring it back home shine my authenticity which is also kind of scary but it's so true like you said like do you just be who you were born to be it's written in the stars <laughs> literally i think it's, uh, i think okay. society has us conditioned to this specific timeline of like graduating high school college getting the white picket fence the marriage you know and then when we're not following that timeline we start being like what's wrong with me something's wrong with me i'm not but it's not like that it's, it's mm-hmm. we're all vastly complex multi-dimensional beings on our own timeline <laughs> and that's Absolutely. okay yeah, yeah that's been fun. it has been so much fun sophie thank you thank you thank, thank you, you so thank much you thank so you much guys for being here absolutely it was so great seeing you guys yes. you as well good luck on your launch thanks bye, bye.